Yep. Yeah. Hey, David, you are on with 50 of your closest friends. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to officially call this meeting to order. The time is 7 11. Roll call, please. Kelson? Here. Peter? Here. Grace? Blackman? Here. Paredes? Here. Please talk. Here. Forrest? Here, and a quorum is present. The first item on the agenda. Uh, audience comments, and we have one audience member who has signed up. It's Karen Hobson. Mm Hello, -hmm. fellow 161 fans and hopeful. I'm really on one hand, pleased to be here, on the other hand, super, super frustrated and hearing some truths that need to out. Uh, when I have four children, the youngest of whom is still matriculating in District 161, I can't tell you how happy I was and how much I felt seen when the first of my three children, uh, the second and the third, all graduated from Harvard with gold on roll and honors never having received a fee or a disciplinary referral at all. And I can't tell you how I'm having a completely opposite experience with my fourth child who has special needs. And I am just here to make a statement about the effectiveness of 161's approach at present in educating twice exceptional students. Twice exceptional means that a student has a significant learning disability, my son, and his case is severe ADHD accompanied by visual ocul ocular or visual motor disability. Um, he's not an easy child to educate. However, he does present also with an extremely high IQ and notable off the record levels of creativity. So we have a very worthwhile student who's worth educating and some clear and present challenges <coughs> to the effectiveness of what he's learning in school. Nathan is 11, he's a sixth grader, he's neuroatypical. Um, he's qualified for special ed education services under ed other health impairment. He presents with poor impulse control, difficulties in executive function, and short-term memory challenges. He's prone to anxiety and shuts down when he's overwhelmed. So Nathan's in school standards test scores often place him in the low average range, as I've stated. Independent testing indicates that he has verbal abilities in the 11th grade range and a very high IQ. He fits the profile of a twice exceptional learner, and the reason I'm here is because I don't feel that our school district actually fits the profile uh, and enforces best practices with regard to educating twice exceptional learners. Um, he has an IP which we were in place in March of 2019. It's after three years of intense resistance from the district. Um, I, at this time, do not feel that it's being implemented with sufficient goodwill judgment or accountability. District 161's lack of budget plan and effective leadership on meeting the needs of my son and others like him has compromised years of his learning potential, contributed to anxiety and behavior problems, and stress the family with significant logistical and financial burdens because we have attempted for four years now to fill the gaps with uh, educational therapy, psychological support, and tutoring outside of school. Uh, this presents us with some significant challenges uh, in terms of my ability to work to help close the financial gaps and my ability to be there for my child as an advocate. I feel like the requirements to do that are uh, there or not to make me feel as if we are being literally forced out of the school district. I'm here to tell you I do not want to go anywhere. I want to stand in the middle here. I recognize completely the best efforts of staff and uh, the amount of time that has been given to trying to help my students. But the fact is that if we don't have a, a coaching plan consistent with industry best practices for dealing with non-traditional learners or learners with health impairments, um, we waste time. 
and it's kind of valuable for my child's education and potentially the education of other students. Um, he has made in, that he has certain IEP goals and has reported insufficient progress for them in quarter one in test initiation, in quarter one for the development of self-awareness and self-management skills. And uh, he has made sufficient progress with his visual motor skill goals. However, they still draw him up quite short of grade level and what he can do. And I repeatedly asked for creative solutions, but what I need is to not be the one pulling the wagon on this to the extent that I have been. Um, if my student presented with an inability to see or hear, I think the treatment path would be a lot clearer. And I need people to recognize that this is a serious lifelong disability environment, and every falter, every step that we fail to take affects him and his ability to live up to his learning potential. Um, I wanted to point out in closing that I am requesting a revisitation of my son's plans and hoping for an improved plan that is put together with the leadership of the school district and not at my own urging and will draw upon the experience of and be implemented by professionals with experience in meeting the needs of twice exceptional learners with severe ADHD to include focused instruction in language arts, math, and executive function support in a self-contained room, an alternative to that of the Thank you. Thank you. Before you sit down, can you just please let us know um, what type of um, contact you've had with district leadership on District leadership meetings. Uh, our Ms. Lapman, superintendent, There's principal. Very consistent contact, though staff changes have made it a little hard to keep up. The path that I set forth for you, I'm sorry that there's so much information in it. I've pulled through literally hundreds of emails since since. Um, the close of the school year last year, the transition team completely changed from when we closed up the grade to the people on staff to implement his transition to Parker. And I requested an additional meeting at the beginning of the year. The contact has been fairly consistent, but mainly at my own urging. And I've had the experience this week of talking with a teacher with 35 years of experience and I've seen my son in her class not learning, being passed over, um, distracting other students, breaking this educator's heart. She told me she can't teach him. He does not want to be the classroom. <coughs> he does that alternative which I asked for him yet to receive. No, would you ask? Uh, this is the first time we've we spoken. I have asked via email since the probably the second week of October to the first manager. Okay. And so in your packet, you have given us your, tell us what's in the packet. Um, there, is, there are tendencies about behavior incidents. Um, there's the tendencies about communication. Um, and communication, behavior incidents, uh, forms that have been utilized to some great success and some really, really awful long-standing challenges to track his behavior. And my big question in submitting those forms is who owns them? Who's responsible for connecting them? Where is the accountability? I've asked the email documents in that are included in your packet, and unfortunately, we can't do them. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Dr. Smith will follow up with you tomorrow. Is that our only? Okay. We are going to keep moving on our agenda. And the next item are, or includes our Parker Girls and Boys Junior High School Cross Country Athletes. Oh.
Well, thank you to our student athletes and parents for coming out. We want to recognize our cross-country boys and girls. Uh, had, had the pleasure of cheering them on down in Normal, and it was just a fantastic day. Great sportsmanship, wonderful kids, excellent coaches. It really couldn't have gone any better. Our young men took uh, third place, and our young ladies took 15th place overall. And I'll tell you, they're, they're just the top in our book. So when I call your name, if you would please come on up. Shake hands, shake hands, and then line up, and then we'll, we'll take some pictures and go. Okay? Let's start with the ladies. Naima Douglas. Mia Caporale. <laughs> Betty Levy. <laughs> Adia Douglas. Mae McGrory. <laughs> and certainly last but not least, Annalise Lee. Our <laughs> ladies cross country team, nice one. Take all the pictures you, you like. You do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go, Daddy, go. Not the dad's first. No. Thank you. Awesome. Great job, everyone. Sebian Burnett. Thank <laughs> you. 
We did have a few, obviously, student athletes with us tonight. Certainly want to recognize them as well. Grace Mullen and uh, Eva Moretti will be with us on the girls' team. Uh, Hatana Webley, Eric Johnson, Matthias Douglas, Jordan Easterling, uh, Remington Bergeron, and uh, Mason Kleinfelder could be with you either. But we're certainly proud of them and want to say congratulations. So thanks, everyone, for coming. really appreciate it. You guys did an amazing job and had an amazing season that would not have been possible without your efforts and the efforts of your amazing coaches. So. Thank you. 
just sent out another survey to get feedback on our draft list of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats we developed at our first uh, strategic planning day. So that information is starting to roll in. The community has an opportunity to add additional items in case our list wasn't comprehensive enough. We'll take that information back to our next day, and that will focus primarily on you know setting our vision. The day after that, we'll uh, focus on planning, and then we'll come to the board um, December, January, start those discussions on the draft plan, hopefully have it approved in uh, February. So it should be, should be pretty good. This Thursday is a half day for school improvement, and the main focus is going to be preparing for our <coughs> Canvas implementation. Uh, we do go live with Canvas on December 2nd, so we're all looking forward to that. We started training weeks ago, uh, but it takes a lot of time, so we want to do a staggered rollout to make sure that teachers have enough time to learn the software, build it out effectively, uh, really just try to work out all the kinks before we go live. So December 2nd is our target, and we're looking forward to that. And then finally, Michelle and I are going to a meeting to work on our presentation. Uh, we're presenting at the statewide AAA conference later this month. Uh, the topic of the presentation is starting fresh, onboarding a new superintendent, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, I'll also be doing a second presentation with our partners at Forecast 5 Analytics on leading with data. So that uh, should be a lot of fun at the AAA conference. Just a reminder, it is right around the corner, and those dates are November 22nd through the 24th. I know the court has reached out on a couple things to get RSVPs and uh, make sure that we all know where everyone's going to make the proper accommodation. So if any changes, let us know. We'll make sure that you guys are taken care of. That's it. What's going on? She's playing. Today I'm not. Triple I conference. That one. 22nd through the 24th. You and I are presenting on the 24th. Oh, I know. It's in your calendar. No. It usually is. Yeah. I can't forget. No, no, you're good. I'm just going to start up. I'm going to start up. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Next item on the agenda, speak uh, two, three committee reports. The first one is the speed governing. I was out of town, so I was unable to attend, and so it was my alternate here, so I will have an update at one of the Monday, January meetings. Thank you. <laughs> Finance committee. So, so we met on the 17th, and so um, the agenda that's provided is pretty self-explanatory. Some of the high level now provided. The, one of our things which you continuously talk about is how to communicate to the community about the levy, what's going on with the levy, keeping everybody you know, up to speed. 
so that continues to be something that we strive to work towards. Um, I, you know, Corinne has a whole presentation as well when I even try to compete with her at all. But there are some pending things that are coming up that we need to be concerned with is with regard to um, collections. She will do a whole projection for us over five years, what it looks like, what doesn't look like, so I will leave that to her. But there are some things that we just need to be aware of ahead of the game instead of getting hit. And we are. So that's basically the point that I'm trying to make. And that we do not have a meeting scheduled as of yet, but we will. And that is pretty much it. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions or comments? <laughs> Okay, community engagement? Sure. Community engagement. Steve, you um, Sure, we talked about uh, <coughs> Sure, we discussed um, the strategic plan um, update and uh, as well as uh, some feedback on the, in the survey from Thought Exchange. Um, there were some opinions um, in terms of some smaller pieces related to the uh, to Thought Exchange, but overall, uh, for the purposes of uh, Thought Exchange, we, as a, as a group, found it to be useful. Um, we have, in terms of uh, communication check-in emails, we have a tighter uh, update schedule. Um, in terms of the district website, we want to make sure that the school district calendars are standard and consistent. Um, in terms of updating events, uh, dessert 161 dates, we have a spring meeting with high school and math pathway for uh, middle slash high school. Uh, or in other words, we have some uh, informational meetings for parents that should be useful with dessert involved. Uh, we discussed the end of the year party as uh, May 27th from 5 to 8 at Parker Junior High School. There will be a DJ, um, a proposed video game truck, and uh, as well as several food trucks. Um, we're going to try to stick to our formula for last year as we think it went really, really well. And, um, and we'll have some time to uh, iron out any, any uh, wrinkles that, um, that pop up before we get to the end of the year, as well as coordinating with other various schools. The, we, we hope to have the uh, police and fire departments there to solidify the connection with, uh, with different organizations within the community. And uh, we are hopeful that, uh, and we're kind of assuming that there will be a lot of PTO games and there will be a lot of PTO input and involvement as well. Uh, we discussed how to engage 161 alumni in terms of either Facebook or contacting high school to get a list of students and email addresses. Uh, we're certainly very proud of the alumni who come out of this school district as our high schools are, and we really want to make that connection between uh, K through 12 and beyond, and really uh, connect to the, really the human content, or that human element of our portrait of graduate, and uh, really uh, look at our, the narrative of success in this district, rather than um, really looking at the school as, you know, the stepping stone for eventually going on to uh, one of our uh, high schools, whether it be uh, Home Flossmoor or uh, one of the <coughs> private schools, or Bloom. Um, again, those are our uh, projects that we're working on right now. Uh, next meeting we have planned for January 27th um, at 6 p.m. and that should coordinate with our uh, strategic planning schedule so that we can make best use of uh, both both meetings. That's it. Dr. Smith, is there anything to add to that? Or? I don't think so. Steven, do you want to make your advice? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we're good. That um, Sybil Baxa continues to attend these meetings. Um, 
But has there been any additional outreach trying to get more community members engaged in the community? Mm -hmm. I, I brought that up. Um, I asked how we were um, sending out these notifications uh, and who was getting these, and Dr. Smith did say that we do email these out. I, I feel like I get, you know, a, a specific invitation, hey, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Blakestra, come to the community engagement meeting. So I don't know if we do specific like that. So that was a question I did have. So maybe we need to do a better job of yeah. making sure all parents are getting the email. Or at a minimum, I mean, a Facebook jerk blast, which an email blast. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it would be, I mean, because in civil attended, you know, she was pretty engaged with this last year. Right. Um, but it would be great yeah, if yeah. there are more parents or community Absolutely. members. One of the things we talked about was that, um, you know, the very first engagement meeting, there was, everyone was here. It was, it, the room was packed and everyone had, you know, something they wanted to say. And you know, we spent time boiling it down in the next, you know, few meetings where we were, you know, it's really important to people and how can we best respond. And, you know, a lot of the same issues that we're, we're kind of dealing with today that, um, hopefully we're, I think we're making some progress on. Um, but once, you know, I think whenever there's something like community engagement comes out in other committees where, um, you know, things start to get addressed and things start to improve, you start to see numbers drop back because it's, it seems like it's a less urgent thing. So something that, you know, meets on our sort of regular basis over the year, if you don't have a very specific reason to really draw somebody in, um, you know, it's it's uh, kind of a challenge to get people to commit, um, you know, the extra hour once every few months because, in a, you know, unavoidably, you know, things come up or someone has to be driven somewhere. And uh, for example, we have a parent who we were really excited. Oh yeah, she's great. You know, she's she's got a lot to offer. She's really interested. Here, yeah. And uh, she had. Uh, you know, couldn't come to the previous one, and so then this one um, she wasn't able to make as well. Um, we hope to see her next time because I thought she had a lot of great ideas. And uh, as a matter of fact, I shamelessly made a uh, commercial at the last engagement. I'm sorry, the last uh, future plan. We would love for more people to come to the engagement. Um, and you know, it's just a general challenge, like a lot of um, non-urgent uh, school events where people have to. You know, leave their house. They have to you know, change their routine. They have to, you know, maybe have you know make arrangements for the kids to do homework with somebody else uh, so that they can come here. Um, and uh, as much as you know, I think we've it's it's worked well that we have uh, put it right before um, an actual scheduled board meeting. You know, it's still a challenge. And at the end of the day, people might lose interest when push comes to shove and they uh, they can't. So. Uh, having said that, yes, absolutely, we're 100% we're interested in um, having more people come. And, you know, the question is, okay, this is fine uh, for now, you know, what about next year? You know, what about three years from now, who's going to you know, take up that, take up that torch? Right. I mean, so it's, it's no fault of the committee members who, and so this is not, um, um, you know, a, a hit on your lack of um, getting the word out by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I don't know, how many families do we have in the district? You know? Any friend? Yes, we have a lot. And we have one. <laughs> yes. Out of a lot. Yes, <laughs> out of a lot. We get one very committed parent who comes um, religiously every single meeting. And so I think if we can just all try and exhaust our efforts. We, we did suggest we would be fair. Or just call people specifically. Hey, yes. No. I, I, I have you know, pressured people to. Yeah. Yes, David. Uh, quick question to Steve and to, uh, to Chris. Um, have there been any thought given to potentially moving the time either to either later in the evening or on the weekend to see if that allows people who may have other commitments that you just named to see to attend? We, we have tried different days. We've tried uh, different venues. Um, I think last year, or, or uh, 
our original plan was, okay, we're going to mix this up. We're going to have every time we have a new meeting, we're going to get a different school, and we're going to, you know, try to workshop what would be the best time for everybody. And, you know, it's it's been pretty consistent that uh, around 6 o'clock seems to work for most people. It's either uh, right when people get off work and before they have to, you know, settle down for dinner and, and help with their homework. Um, and, uh, you know, just in terms of moving to different schools, I think that might have been a little challenging. Um, and I myself, at one point, forgot which school we were meeting at. Uh, and luckily, Carolyn uh, was was able to respond and make sure I got there. Um, but, you know, so we, we, we tried some different stuff. We're certainly open to suggestions. And, um, you know, it, the bottom line is that you have to have a reason for people to come. And sometimes that reason is food. Um, like we've, we've talked about in previous meetings with getting people to come to board meetings. Uh, sometimes that is an event that's happening roughly around the same time. And, you know, sometimes, and we, hopefully this is not necessarily the case, where there's um, a perceived uh, issue that needs to be addressed urgently, and, um, and that's typically when you get most people. I mean, it's... I think the other thing to remember is that the engagement and community engagement committee is not at the committee, it's at the events, right? And so I'd be more concerned if people didn't come out to the desserts and to the end of the year parties and the beginning of the year parties and those things because that work happens at the committee level. So, you know, we certainly, to Michelle's point, I really truly appreciate Sybil showing up, you know, week in and meeting out. But it'd be great to have a couple, of course, a few more parents to, to form a strong core. So maybe we can reach out and then, you know, things came up and other people couldn't make it. So uh, you know, we'll keep focusing on the events. We'll see if we can expand uh, to a few other parents. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is executive session. If, if, it's if we feel that we need executive session to discuss personnel. No. I don't I'm fine. Okay. So uh, let's see. Can I have a motion please to approve the consent agenda item which includes the revised personnel report? So moved. In a second? Really? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Roll call please. Chris? Yes. Freitas? Yes. Yes. Nelson? Yes. Lanier? Oh, uh, Lanier? Yes. Yeah. Blackman? Yes. Corey? Yes, and the motion is passed. Now we're going to move to several discussion items if there are things to discuss in the previous category. The first item is the special ed plan. Oh, oh I'm sorry, we are switching G and F. Sorry, G and H. We're going to switch around a little bit this evening since we have guests. And we are going to first discuss the educational advocacy assessment. Sure. So, uh, Mike is here from Wold. Uh, part of our process, getting ready for the strategic plan, has been taking a multi year view. As you know, ideally, sometime around February, we'll have a strategic plan that is in final format that will be approved by the Board of Education. That will lay out all of our educational goals, that will lay out our vision, exactly what we're trying to deliver for the kids in our community. As we've discussed a couple of different occasions, as we talked about Heather Hill at the beginning of this year, Western Avenue at the beginning of this year, uh, we need to take a look at our buildings and facilities to make sure that they're aligned with our, apparently our social, emotional, and educational aspirations. And so we talked about an educational adequacy assessment to get the strategic plan done, and then engage the community after that, staff members, administrators, parents with children, parents without children, to really set, set up the facilities for success. So Mike, do you want to talk about just that process and what it looks like? Yeah, I think that um, there's kind of Community engagement is key to this, and stakeholders uh, are very critical to this. So engaging people that really have a vested interest in uh, education and the facilities. Um, so what we're proposing is next spring in February, we would begin the process of so a five-month process. And it's really broken up into three phases. 
One is the fact gap gathering phase, and that's what um, uh, <coughs> really incorporates looking at each building, going to each site, and looking at how the buildings align with the way you deliver education. Are there um, things that are hindering people from the students from getting that education? Um, and parallel to that is setting up a core planning group for, um, for the long range plan. And that could that involve educators, parents, students, um, a number of board, couple board members if you want. Um, and we'll lead that process. And it's basically meeting every, twice every month between February and um, May. And we'll cover topics, um, we'll do vision sessions. We'll begin to discuss all the findings of the educational adequacy. And the educational adequacy is going to look at things like the functionality of the school, for example, the technology, the safety, um, how the rooms are being used, are there enough parking places, the furniture is there. So it's really like an assessment, you know, great teacher, you're good, and then we'll take that information back to this, back to the committee, the vision. And so the committee is really be made up by select people, <coughs> invite, you know, like an application process, we want to be on the um, And then follow that process and begin to look at where you want your schools to be five, ten years from now. Are they future ready? Are they preparing our students? Are they physically ready to that? And then we'll look at solutions at the group. So in May and June, we'll start to look at those solutions. And then Long range planning committee will bring the solutions forward to the board and make those recommendations. So it's kind of that those three parts of fact finding, visioning, and solutions. Um, so remind us again when the strategic plan will be done. In Lover's group, I believe it's like February 9th. Okay, February 9th. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the action. Okay, so how will. Um, what comes out of the strategic plan fold into the work that you will begin? Well, yeah. frankly, that's the vision, the vision piece that we might talk about. That's exactly, this is what we agreed to deliver, this is what the board wants to do over the next five years, academically, social, emotionally, engagement, you name the different pieces. Do our buildings match up with that yeah. perspective? And, and as we compare the two, at the end, we should have a plan that says, okay, this is what you want to do. Here's where your buildings are. These are, the, these are the solutions that would move us forward and put those physical spaces in the best position to serve our kids and our teachers. <coughs> how aggressive to respond to those recommendations and how to pay for them all. And the assumption is that in October of 2020 is when we will start implementation? Yes. We're really looking at it now. Once you know what the vision is and the, the why, let's say, and the benefits of it, then you have to look at what, how does it really get the what does it cost, and how are we going to project that out over 10 years? So yeah, you can start in October, but it could be a small project, it could be a larger one. Where we'll decide that um, after we decide what the solutions are, how they can make that recommendation forward. Uh, it could be, yeah. that's where the entrances could come. You know, you, we'll decide how to parse those out. <coughs> and some, again, some, are, some will be unfortunately not very provocative and we'll never see how that money is spent, but it's just critical for the upkeep of the buildings and maintaining yeah. an effective physical plan. But other things, the entrances, moving some spaces around can have a profound effect and that's really the next uh, report that we have which is the like steam labs. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. great in our spaces and different pieces of the puzzle and putting in one spot with mm -hmm. the report for a show on our current year. Hey Dana? Yes. So um, I'm just trying to make sure I understand um, when I'm looking at the um, the long range plan is is this these are these three components of fact finding vision concept analysis to begin somewhere in February and end in September of 
20? Probably February to June of 20. And then implementation, and realistically, we'll probably start that fall with the board making choices about which projects to pursue and which ones not to. So you would be presenting. Okay, I'm trying to do better. This is the test in the master plan, but go down to the end, where it says school board approval master plan. What, what month is that? September. September 2020. Okay, so this is October. At that point, it's done because that implementation is in October, right? Of course, I'm going to go back to the According to this document, yes. <clears throat> but implementation can be eight years from now. I mean, the master plan is. The vision. So, okay. why don't we give it? <clears throat> could be you know, something you can start on. So, but, um, I think, David, in my view, the deliverable from the architects is that in August they'd be delivering their recommendations to us. Okay, and I'm looking for when it's delivered. What that one for? Okay. So, um, did you have more questions, David? Uh, not, not, not so the fee for this is um, fifty-eight thousand, right? It, um, and I understand what it means to be a fee because there's no guarantee that we would ever do any of this work. Um, on the other hand, let's say we say these are all great recommendations. In the next ten years, we get a bond issue, we get ten or twelve million dollars of work. Uh, can you, that fee credit against them? Because you guys want to get a percentage of that work, right? Assuming you guys are the architect for all of the next ten years. Yeah. Would you credit us with any of that back on the plan? Or? I think that it's something that we would want to look at. I don't know if it's the full amount. I mean, there are, you know, there are, there's a time commitment on our part to organize it and participate in meetings. But certainly, usually when we do like a sudden, we usually will be back, you know, a half a bit, let's say, but it wouldn't be pulled out. But if it was a study um, security, Decided to do a security study, um, knowing that we're going to do a best goal. You know, something like more specific. I think we can, we can give that forward. Um, so we, yeah, definitely going to work with that. Um, but the full amount, you keep in mind, is a five-month process. Uh, there's usually two or three of our architecture each meeting. We walk each and every one of the buildings, interviewing all the staff. Um, yeah. Or, so, but yes, we're willing to work with you um, and understand it's kind of looks like a little bit of a sticker shot, but just keep in mind that it's, you know, five or six months of us. So we're going to build a team on board for two or three representatives. Well, it's, um, it's not so much sticker shots to me, like okay. I said. Um, they may, you know, whether or not the, the price quote is a good value is determined mm -hmm. by the end product. Yeah, if we don't even see it. It's not, it's, it may, um, so, uh, that, that's really it, you know. Um, you guys are here to get to talk to a bunch of firms, and yeah. we thought you guys gave the best presentation. Um, but it's not like we had a firm, you know, that uh, what would be charged for the plan? You know, and they think they give us wildly different prices, but also wildly different results. Yeah. I would give you a sample of the results, give you a sample to distribute, um, and realize that along the way we were getting constant feedback if we feel that you know, we're not delivering or um, the documentation that we communicate to everybody. Um, so I'm just pretty comprehensive. So I understand that, um, and, I mean, just on a basic, we get paid as we go. And, um, so, uh, well, yeah, we can give you a copy of the deliverable um, for working with some districts um, that if we give you examples, you can call them to see what you know, the problems are. Um, but yeah, we think it's a solid process to believe in it. Um, it's been successful to bring districts um, from kind of ground zero up till really that full day for the next 10 years. Um, and we'll be following that with you. We'll be helping you, you know, implement it. We'll know all your key players, you know. And so we'll develop those relationships with, with you and get to know us and get to know our staff. So, um, yeah, that's a, a 
big commitment, what we're excited about. We think it's very valuable. It's been tried and to test it with other districts. Um, also evolving. It changes over time. It might have to change gears. Um, so, but yeah, I understand that I will we'll give you copies of it. I think Sam will be very happy with that too. Well, <coughs> board members understand what that was put there might be sure. paying for it and also, you know, for the inevitable community members for their are at. Yeah. About their tax bills. Okay. You know, I was spending two thousand dollars on something like this. So I'll bring the number of the Because otherwise between now and next August we don't have anything to show you. So or we might have the meetings and stuff. But yeah, I mean we'll be producing um, documents and you know we'll be presentations, um we'll be documentation uh, along the way kind of like build itself on top of itself. Okay. So you don't just have that one all of a sudden right in June you have this all the all the stuff that you can kind of deliver you know, so yeah, we'll be copies and uh, the educational app alignment study, um, the visioning summary, and then we'll take the next week. That'd be great. Okay. Any other questions regarding any of the items? Okay. Any other questions regarding this document for this specific item? Now we will move to the steam lab. Sure. So we, keeping with our, our commitment, you know, we had a great plan for the steam labs at the elementary schools and there's really no reason to wait on a good decision. So we moved ahead with implementation this year, knowing that we weren't going to make any changes to the physical spaces at the elementary schools. We wanted to get into the program, implement it, and then come back and talk about any changes that we would like to make. So this report is for two things. It's any physical changes that we want to make to the spaces, and then it's also additional furniture. So, actually, can you pull up? Thank you. I'm secretary. That's the breakdown. Uh, the total that we're looking at uh, is worth about four hundred and seventy thousand uh, dollars. You're if we're counting, I think we if we went it somewhere around two hundred seventy-five and donated funds for the STEAM lab at Serena. But based on what we think, you know, this should rival, you know, the great spaces that we have. You will notice there is some additional money in there for Serena Hills. We, we have to, we have to separate the space. Yeah. We have to separate the space. It's just, it's too, too large of an area for kids. They do an incredible job and age is great and all of the staff members at Serena are really respectful of each other. But if you go to Flossmoor Hills, for example, or to Western, or to Heather, the, that library is naturally divided. And so we still need to make a few changes in those spaces, but there are physical barriers that can block sound uh, and just make, just control sound a little bit better. So we do need to make a few changes at, at Serena, most of the construction will be moving power, putting it in the floor, so that the teachers have flexibility on where they, where they want to set up the stations. Um, so, you know, paint, carpet, those sorts of things. Nothing uh, overly exuberant or decadent by any means. Um, the hundred fifty thousand dollars in furniture is basically um, is obviously for all the schools and. We're trying to be as smart as humanly possible about this. This was in our conversations about spending down fund balance and a way to use uh, our dollars most effectively uh, to affect the most students. So obviously our STEAM labs, all of our students get to participate in and uh, experience those lessons. So we're really excited about the opportunities. Um, so Dr. Smith, my, I'm just gonna ask this to ask in terms of the, uh, the furniture costs. Um, have you looked at it and there, is it a measurable value added to um, change out the furniture uh, as opposed to making do with existing? Um, I know it's, it's really, you know, the chairs you probably get away with. It really just comes down to the tables are used to set up the, the computer banks and all of those sorts of things. Okay. So, in your recommendation and, and perspective, the, the uh, furniture 
that changes at a measurable value, sure. by which we will be glad that we've done this. Absolutely. The flexible seating offers uh, different learning opportunities for kids and it really allows the teachers to decide how the space is going to be. I appreciate the concern, and I, I could be 100% wrong. So I'm not going to disagree with you. I think I talked to you or Andrea, or Sherry, or somebody last year. You know, what could we have done differently? Yep. What, right? And what, you know, we decided we were debating construction and furniture. I'm pretty sure one of them told me, yeah, now that I'm at it, the furniture. Oh, like all the, like the, uh, all the hair dry erase tables and all of those things. Yeah, I don't remember which it was. Maybe it was just, I think actually someone told me about the dry erase tables. <coughs> So, I mean, or we also spent a hundred thousand dollars in the first to one school. I appreciate one trip here, much less yeah. than what we spent there. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, we really, I mean, we really had an example of what we did on this. Like, she's the yes. one doing everything. Yeah, we, we made sure that Andrew was involved. And I would say probably her biggest aha is more hard space on the ground to work. Because the robots don't really do well on the carpet which isn't anything we just wouldn't have thought about. So she was really integral in the process. We brought all of our STEAM teachers in, and I uh, know we really appreciate it. What is the second architecture we have here on the connection? That's the first year cost. So the top, it's actually color-coded. You can't. Yeah. So Flossmore Hills Lab, through estimated reimbursable expenses, is construction. The two items below that are furniture. So specking out all of the furniture, doing all the drawings for the furniture, those things. That's where that nine thousand dollars comes in. Twenty-one five or twenty-one thousand one hundred and fifty for architectural engineering. Above that, covers any of the changes from construction, electric, all those things. So, so what happens there? Hey, yes. Go ahead, David. Uh, I'm sorry, Cameron. I, I, I can't do that. I'm going to do the devil. Go ahead, David. Um, okay, so. I heard you give an overview of what the 80, 80, 80, and 20 are for. Is it possible for us to get you know, some of a, a, a breakout of that um, in more detail? I know I'd like to see it because, again, I, I understand their cost for all these things. I, I know there's an estimate, um, but I, I would, I'd still want to put that in the as well. Well, essentially, what you have to approve is the development of all of that work. So, yes, but we have to pay for it, right? And so that's what we have to, that's what we're going to approve. We have to agree to eventually pay for it. All right. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, yeah, so you can see that, I mean, if, you, if you're, I guess the question would be how, how much detail are you looking for? Mm -hmm. We can put together the list of, again, it's carpet, it's paint, it's moving, of the electrical into the floors, cutting all the slabs, doing all you know that kind of stuff. It's going to be some some sound barriers. Could be a wall here and there. These are more like this is a budget. Where this is a budget? These are the targets we're asking them to hit. Yep. Then the architects will get to work figuring out how to, what they can do within these numbers. Right. So you had a preliminary discussion where they think they can deliver something pretty workable for these. Yep. Do you have another question, David? Yeah, so these numbers here are really, the architects think that they can deliver something workable with these numbers, but they're essentially, what we're being asked to prove is this has a budget, right? Then they're going to come up with an $80,000 plan <coughs> lost for our Hills lab and show it to us, and then at that point we would, you know, probably improve it or may ask for changes to it, right? Or they may come up with a cheaper alternative as they're working, they may tell us as they're working that, you know, the Heather Hill lab is going to cost more. Um, but these are, these are just the budget estimates. They don't have detailed breakdowns of these numbers, I don't think. And, and, and I get that, and, I, and this is my last question on it. I guess what I'm making sure of, and, and this is just really challenging, the head nod, within the $80,000 per school plus the 20 um, for Serena, uh, is 
very significant confidence that that will actually be enough to cover every that needed to uh, not have to come back with again. Yeah, so we, um, again, yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, head nod is been received. Oh, yeah. All right. Still confident that those numbers will, will cover that. And the contingency and in there already, so. Yeah, the contingency would be because it's an existing building and sound and building walls over top of the building. Anyway, we wait for that existing building. Heather Hill, for example, if I remember the layout correctly, he's got a media room, like we, we have a discussion, right? The front office and mm-hmm. there's a media room in the center. And I admittedly haven't spent enough time in the building, but I don't know. It's where are we putting this lab? Because I just worry that you know if you're going to what's going to happen when you start doing the assessment, and the next thing you're like, you know, we spent a lot of time inside of the lab. I thought the was actually awful. It just doesn't work. You just need to do it. Um, so how do we prevent that? How do we account for that? I don't want to spend the money and then find out what you can. Well, or can I interject? Building on that, maybe, um, can you elaborate on some discussion uh, around those issues? Have you considered other spots? You'd be, you know, sketched in the direction that you go. Well, I think some of the, well, a lot of the questions we ask when we do the, do the assessment is what are some of the initiatives? And clearly, this is an initiative that you have the best of interest in already you know, constructed one. Um, tested it, you kind of, you know, the instructors have like, ideas that are thinking ahead, and that's usually, typically, that's one question we ask. Um, now, where goes the building in, you know, in a good location? Um, I don't think we would necessarily put it in other parts. Um, so I think that I feel good, you know, that because we've done this work up front, um, that it would be a good position there to. To put it in that area. Is that, is that what you're asking? That no, I guess uh, when I look at my unit with the map, of yeah. I look at it and go, this building makes no sense. Mm-hmm. Especially oh, where that exactly where I think we would be putting this. Yeah. And so, I'm, so I, I don't know if you guys have gotten that far in the project, but it, you know, it would be good to tell me I'm wrong. You can fix everything else that's wrong with the entrance and the security issues there. But um, right now, my media center, that's what the big room is called. It looks like it should be all and so yeah. it doesn't it, it, and so you know if this is a project we're gonna approve now, I guess start construction you know in May. Yeah. But you guys at the same time are doing the you know global um, advocacy assessments. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean I imagine at some point in the process you would come to us and say, you know, just you need to get another health example. Yeah. Um, it's not going to work. We need to move that. Or right. since we're going to be moving this entrance in right. October, maybe we should not put this media center or the, you know, right. something like that. I can see where you're going I'm worried about the conflict between those two schedules. Yeah. But it's a, it's a concern. Um, I think that we should, um, looking at the plan, I mean, the building is the, the building is the building. Some extent, and um, you know, we've got the we're going to be looking at the number of classrooms and um, that entrance. I understand is is something we'll look at closely with the security and you know, what they put there. Um, just looking at it, I think I think we should. I think we, when we do this um, design, we should look at you know look a little forward. I don't think it would inhibit it. I don't think it would inhibit us forward. Um, but point well taken that we should look at the whole floor plan and not look at it just that one. I would agree. Um, knowing like Heather Hill with the office is potential here to look at. You know, are we going to put the front office where the media center is probably not? Um, so I think that I think it's a good, good point, and we should look at it not just the number that we should work on. We should maybe pull forward. We could also. Yeah. Do Right, and because I, I suppose in theory you could make the same case of Western or Boston or really 
you know, I, 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 we've been talking about this kind of your thing, and we put you off. I mean, it's just like, I think at some point we need to make a decision by looking at what we got to deal with about the intro. This is a different, we're, this is a different issue, but I mean, we have the same, to David's point, we have the same issue, you know, at Western, you want to look at that entrance, but we also have the smallest library, right? So, I guess the question is, you know, on a more global scale, but also remember, we're talking about millions of dollars, right? So, when we had that initial conversation about the Heather Hill entrance, it was somewhere around 1.2 million. So, um, well, what about, I so, if the Steam Lab, because we had this discussion around Sabrina, right? And really, the experience of the Steam Lab is, I mean, lighting helps and electrical, and little, but that stuff's not super expensive, right? Yeah. It's really the furniture and, and computers and spaces, right? Um, if the components of the Steam Lab, for those of that are larger than that stuff, is movable. Then my concern is less of a problem. Right? Sure. So that, okay, so yeah, we're gonna this room in a couple of years, but if we can move the stuff to a better room, right. Right. that's fine. Um, I guess I, I wouldn't want to see a lot of hard you know, running with some models and stuff is fine. Sure. I wouldn't want to see a lot of money in the hard, you know, moving a wall and, oh, yeah. and, and okay. doing stuff like that that we're gonna end up carrying down the street. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah. Yeah, the reality is I think even if we held off um, from doing the Dean Lab construction next summer, pending this bigger assessment, yeah. it's still possible that the Steam Labs then would not go in for several more years because we are not going to do major construction on all three buildings in 2021. So we could decide that whatever happens to Heather Hill may not be until 2025, for example. So we would want to hold off the steam lab until 2025. Yes. So, um, okay, when do we have to vote on this? Next week. So, and we're voting on the, the only thing we're voting on is the actual amount, and then this guys will go and do. They will bring the plans back. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so. Um, We're approving wall to go start this work. So We're then, going under. would it be feasible, you know, when wall comes back to, without creating, you know, burdens or time and energy, to have some sort of ideas or scope about how some of the ideas that we've discussed, that we've discussed tonight, might look in the future on a very sketch level, as opposed to. I need to be a little bit more specific. Okay, I guess I'm trying to. Try not to get too, at least too specific, but maybe can, is there, when we come back um, and have this discussion, can we address some of the issues in any way um, that we brought up tonight regarding um, Heather Hill and some of the other issues? If we are voting on this next month. Mm -hmm. They're not going to start voting. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm secondly like this anyway. But, um, well, you want to make sure that we don't do anything that flies in the face of the new strategic plan. Like we don't want to do yeah. this and then later say, wow, right. right. yeah. we want all these cool alternative spaces and that. I get that. So I, I like what you just said. Why can't we do more oh, along so what you important. said, which is make sure that we have the structure but not tear down walls or put mm -hmm. up walls? Like, can we just say to wall here, just don't go past this? Or don't tear down the ceiling. Well, just tear down the cheap ones. Not structure. Yes, correct. No, and I get the balance is form versus function, right? We stream is too loud. Right. So no matter what. No matter what. <laughs> right. Um, and I would say that consistently at the other labs, we need some way to separate those spaces. It doesn't have to be a full hard wall, but they're just too loud. The you only know, kids are, you know, 25 kids programming robots, yes. you know, over there. You can hear it right here. Right. And so we need some ways to separate these pieces. I think 
the plans are generally not yes. eighty thousand dollars in construction costs. Right. Right. Zero. Yeah. 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 And to do a little bit of gut check to say, is this really the right place? Oh, good. You know, so there's still okay. some activity, design activity that's going on. Mm -hmm. And you know, it can be shelved at the end of design and you know, come back to it. But I think, I think it's an exercise that's worth going through. Um, I wouldn't say it's going to conflict with the massive ones. Um, looking at it, what other, other types of STEM that we've done usually are. Well, the, that noise barrier wall so we had to go also in the summer. It, sure. It, yeah. sure. That's that um, that for the summer. Yeah. If it's the, correct. In this number, yes, we have to put it Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go back to the beginning. <laughs> Very good piece. Special ed plan update. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to bring the update for the special education um, action plan for this current school year. I would like to introduce um, two of the case managers that are here tonight. We have um, Colleen McLaurin. She is at Heather, uh, excuse me, she's at Western Avenue and at Foster Hills, and Angel Stapleton, who is at Serena Hills and Heather Hill. Uh, Deborah Dunwoody, who is at Parker and is our uh, liaison to IJP, couldn't be here tonight. She's in graduate class. She's finishing up the doctor's class, so I figured that was a good reason for her to be coming. Um, what I really want to touch on is when we went through, we have our performance action, our performance goal one, which is our structures. All the structures really have been acted on. Um, the last is to continue to review the clustering at, and inclusion at the elementary schools. We did it last year to a point, but the conversations have already started in some of the buildings as they're thinking of already ahead to the master schedule for next year. So we're very excited about that. Um, schedules will revise, um, more uh, heterogeneous groupings at Parker, 7030 has been maintained in all of the classrooms, we've optimized co-taught, uh, the, the facilitation at Parker has been phenomenal, um, working with the building administration, with Deborah, um, Amabel, Michelle, Tara has been outstanding, the staff has really responded very well to the changes. We also, at the elementary resource, have um, put into effect, we've asked them to push in more in their schedule. As you can see, I have a representative of five different teachers. Um, an increase for one teacher, approximately 270 minutes, an increase in push-in time, 450 minutes for another, 780 for another, and then the, the last teacher was here pushed in quite a bit last year, and so she's pushing in just a tiny bit more this year, but we found it to be very effective. Um, one, of the, one of the quotes from the teachers, I just kind of would like to read a piece of it. Um, Amy Green, a resource teacher at Surrey Hill, says, I think in a lot of ways it has been so beneficial to the students to push in time. The older students want to be part of their classroom, even if they are working with a teacher. I've seen the benefits of guiding them and working with their peers. They smile, they feel smart, because they're able to talk about the same thing their peers are talking about and learning about. Being in the rooms and knowing and seeing how things are taught help me use the same language, etc. So there isn't that disconnect that feeling when there's time when all the time is pulled out. I'm also able to modify on the spot. This is not only helpful for the kids, but the teachers can see how easy it can be. The biggest benefit I think is the flow of things and the fact that there isn't a disconnect when supporting them in my classroom. Their days in shopping, everything they're doing with me, they can apply throughout their day. I just want to spend it. So I think that was a great summary. I just asked the teachers just to comment on the push-in. And you know, we also, Laura Surdek from Plus Health also responded, and the quote is listed here. 
So all in all, our uh, action plan one, or goal one, I think has been met with great success. But again, we're still working on little bits and pieces of it. Um, performance goal two, interventions and progress monitoring. We are currently um, implementing interventions and are still looking for additional interventions and for teaching strategies that will help us facilitate um, the, the interventions and the, for special education, that extra, extra piece that we need. Um, we're reviewing, if we had positive and negative results, um, we, with the Ames Web testing, we have had, we ran into a little bit of a, of a, a, a rough patch. Uh, the MTSS coaches have been phenomenal. They have researched and, and stepped up and found ways around the glitches that we did experience. We've been working directly with Ames Web. Um, we just have, uh, we've been having a little bit of issues with the survey level assessment part of it. And so we've been talking as a team from the MTSS perspective and we'll be presenting some recommendations to the administration. So we did what, what we were kind of, we thought would work really well based on what Ames Wood had said last year, which was doing a survey level assessment and kind of circumventing that benchmark piece. But the benchmark, um, because the benchmark would take quite a bit of time, but as we, as we found, the survey level assessment pieces has taken some time, there's been some glitches and we've worked through it. So we are kind of doing all that. Um, so as far as student practices within, within this section, we have, uh, the intern has created the process to pull the information out in info for progress monitoring. We have not started that yet. We have um, been slightly delayed with the progress monitoring piece, but that is up and running now. And we didn't, in, in, excuse me, we didn't put in the student practice of looking at their strengths yet. Everyone was very busy with the surveillance assessment, working on the other pieces, so we're pushing that out at the same time. So our staff will be pulling the student strengths for the students. They'll also be pulling a math report, which talks about their strengths and their areas of need, and we'll be reviewing that with the kids to have a double pieces of their strengths to work with. We look at the next, the achievement gap goal. We have uh, positive connections with the school teams. We've been reviewing the scores. We've reviewed the growth scores. And we'll probably talk about that more when we talk about the IAR scores at the next meeting. Um, those growth scores are moving really target. And we will really explain how the state explains that moving target to us. Um, special ed is working with the school teams. And it's very integrated with Jenna and special ed. The evidence analysis statements come out for the whole building. They're not specific to Jenna or special ed, they're, they're specific to what we're teaching. And so they've been working as buildings on those. Um, all the work this last year hit is really, I think, proven um, that we've, we've made significant differences. And we're gonna continue making these positive changes for students. I have to tell you, I'm really very pleased with the special ed the administrators we have are really getting in there and working with their building administrators to really, really bring it all full circle. Nobody's working in a silo. And it's we're really in a very good part. Are there any questions? I have one. Um, other than feedback that we saw on here, which is great, uh, how are you measuring progress? I know you said you spoke about AIMS Web. Um, how are we looking at the progress of our teachers and how are, are we talking about really measuring on, on how we're doing? So we're measuring student progress using the progress monitoring tool in AIMS Web. Okay, so, yeah. so we're, we've set a starting point um, for most of our items. There's been a couple, like I said, there's been a couple of glitches we're still working through on those. But we will be progress monitoring and looking as the students um, increase in reading, mathematics. Those are our, our key areas that we're going to progress on, our multiple areas of reading and multiple math. From the beginning of the year to now, would you say that you've seen a nice improvement or a, a marked improvement a little bit at least? I mean, I know the teachers have seen it, so you would think. The teachers have seen it. Um, that both, that's all subjective data. Um, I don't have any analytical data because the progress monitoring data has not been put in place yet. So I don't, 
I see positive, it's, but it's subjective. What, what we're seeing is currently subjective. I don't have any objective data to get. This, just to build up what um, this instructor uh, was saying, and I, and I think um, this may have been where she's going with this. Uh, I was looking at the, the comments from the, from the special ed teachers who were putting in, and I thought, oh, that's terrific. Um, to what degree, and I, and I think that we're being a lot more intentional um, this year in, in really pulling off what we what has been a success last year and really uh, building on that, I think it's great. Uh, but I, I guess I was kind of interested in, are we looking at any sort of um, gen ed reflective piece to find out to what degree uh, gen ed teachers are really learning more about um, you know, like what the needs of, of those kids are. So that, um, you know, when, uh, and, and I think, you know, just thinking in terms of my own experience as a, as a teacher, you know, when I was a gen ed teacher, then I transitioned to even reading specialist, which is in gen ed, but then to special ed. But, um, you know, I recognized, oh, I started to see things with a, a lens that was entirely differently, and it really changed my perspective. Um, and even working with kids who have remarkable behavioral issues and just you know as an adult learning one of the hardest things is learning to think differently and uh, looking differently at my own expectations uh, I would be interested to know and maybe this is you know too soon to get anything that's that's really telling you know at the end of like a certain time period what what have gen ed teachers learned from working with their uh, special ed co-teachers in a push-in yes. push model, which I, I wrote down, I'd be happy to yeah. construct mm -hmm. some sort of survey to yeah. ask them. Because <coughs> as we have, and especially when looking at, you know, veteran teachers who are, you know, here because they are terrific, but, um, you know, that also spans, you know, huge ideological shifts in the way our culture looks at kids with special needs mm -hmm. to find out, um, you know, how they have adapted to look at kids differently to specifically um, address their your differentiated needs uh, while maintaining the uh, the standards that they have for the whole class. Because I, and I do think that there's a great point you made where older kids are very interested in staying with that class. And that self-esteem issue is tied to, you know, not being removed from the group, but really being a part of that classroom and getting that uh, differentiated support uh, brought into the class and then other students benefiting from that as well because when you bring in a um, you know a special ed teacher to you know a class it's not like it was in the 60s or the 70s it's it really is an extra lens and it's extra support for everybody um, in the periphery not just that one kid I think there's absolutely a balance that goes with it. I sure. think there's a balance between sometimes full out instruction is warranted and it is right. very effective for that student, but always pull out or always push in, I don't think is good. I, I think the, the balance there, we need to keep reflecting on that and find the right balance to really maximize our instruction. I think that means that. Yes. No, no, you're you have the floor. You're good. Okay. Um, um yeah, the young and the poor is about not the second in the most of that is already on the The bullet of the report were things that we talked about mid year right. The, the pink, I mean, so none of the things that are listed are surprising to me. I don't see where it's been actually moving um, in many areas. I appreciate what Robin has said um, to try to explain some of it because the what was presented should be um, these off issues. I, I have a simple question. I, I thought at the last meeting that we discussed getting some type of an audit um, and or assessment of our special education program and how the public uh, trying to find um, some much needed assistance for our special education director. Um, where are we with those issues? Well, 
probably have a couple of responses. One, uh, that they don't exist, where I'm having trouble with you know, the two other superintendents today. Uh, neither of them have had any luck with any sort of special education audit. Uh, when I went down to uh, another gathering, large gathering of superintendents, the people, the districts that I was targeting uh, had underperforming special education subgroups. So they're probably not the, the peers that we're looking for. So I'm, I'm open to all suggestions uh, in order to do a special education audit. Um, I'd say your second question is probably a closed session topic for discussion if you want to have so I have, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Sharon. Thank you. Patiently wait to take this time. Go ahead. Uh, so I can't stop thinking about Ms. Hobson, <coughs> the things that she spoke about, but then also it's connected to something that you said, Robin, about uh, a glitch that you discovered with Ames. And I'm wondering how, within this plan, I'm kind of pulling out from the specifics and looking more for and a better understanding of the generalized information implementation and what happens when we, we have a glitch, like the Ames Web, and what happens when we have clear evidence of something that isn't working. Um, I'm just trying to understand what happens, because it's helpful to see the progress, and it's helpful to understand the independent pieces that are addressing the specific goals. But I imagine the Ames web glitch won't be the only glitch, and I imagine that Ms. Hobson isn't the only person just because of the district this size. I can imagine that there are other people who have either fallen into the cracks or who were just not servicing them. And how do we, as a piece, as this district, how do we make sure, how do we check ourselves? And maybe that's to the audit question. How do we? have a better understanding on when things don't work, when the goals that we're working on are not meeting the needs of every student. How, what, what, and how does that kind of interface with these goals? And, and in some ways, it's like juggling plates. Like, so we're starting with maybe a yellow, will then turn blue, and maybe it'll turn pink. I'm just trying to have a better understanding of what happens and how we make sure that the, that the glitches don't overwhelm us we don't end up back where we were if we don't have a system in place to deal with some of these things. Okay? And that's my question. And how do we, how can we begin to identify other glitches? Right. How do we make sure? How do we make sure, right, because I don't know if we are aware of all of the glitches, and that's not, um, um, I'm not placing blame. I think that there's a lot that's been happening in our district, in our special ed program over the past several years. Um, and clearly there are glitches because our data at least um, sheds light on there's something that's happening. There's something that's going um, not necessarily in the direction that we want. So how do we begin to identify? Our data shows the opposite. Our, the data that you showed, that, that you all showed us at the last meeting on our special ed showed that at, certainly at Parker, that we have we have groups of kids who experience zero growth. Oh yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not saying right. I, right. I, I would agree, but I would say overall, I would say that's not the case, right? So and we have, obviously we have other indi indicators that we're, we'll be able to share later on this week. But I think our data is, but our data hasn't changed since you showed it to us the last time, right? Correct, and that, that's, that's what I'm sure, right? And so, <clears throat> I think we can, there are absolutely troubles with our special education data, but I, I would not say that it's in the dumpster. It's certainly, as a, as a whole, it's no worse than our free reduced numbers. Right, it, you know, it, you know what I'm saying. It <coughs> certainly has to improve. I don't. I don't know if all our indicators would say that we are tanking. Right, and that's that's kind of the impression. As, well, as we well, have this well, well, there's a reason why. We, but there's a reason why we're doing this. Like, there's a reason why we have all of these sure. specific goals. It's mm -hmm. not because we felt satisfied with where we were performing. Right. So, in ourselves, fast, go back actually to this exact 
same time last year when we were having this exact same conversation. So we recognize ourselves, and, and we said we want to do better. We really we want that to happen. But so regardless of the data or how we interpret it, just if we look at this, this Ms. Hodgson presented us, the fact that we don't have 2E on our forms, to me, that's a, fl a red flag. And I don't know if we if we are, I don't want to miss anything. I want to make sure that we've captured all of the pieces and that we have a, a good system in place that goes back and says, are we really doing what we said we were going to do? Do we know why we're still doing what we're doing? Do we know where we were and where we are and how much space has been in between? Regardless, even if the state comes and says, you are the best at special ed in the state of Illinois, I still want us to be able to say, yes, we've faithfully served all of our students. We've done everything and we've put the money, the people, the resources, all of those things in place. I just want to make sure of that. I, I think if I could add, I, the, I, I completely agree with you, uh, but I, I think that, um, and this is not a, you know, um, a dismissal, I think a lot of our um, student success um, is, is episodic. It is, um, you know, and it is a smaller sample size, and it, it, there are a lot of moving pieces, and there's a lot of moving pieces that come continuously both from the state, um, both from new teachers, you know, um, teachers that are growing into uh, working with their students. Uh, there's developmental needs of students that shift from fifth grade to sixth grade, which I can tell you from a personal level can be breathtaking. You know, we, you know, I've gone through that once and I'm going through it right now. Um, and it's something that, you know, the, um, so it, what's terrific about this, you know, really focusing on a special ed program is it really, I think, epitomizes the, um, the need for a school to respond to the individual learner and to the individual need. And so to your point, you know, absolutely, of course we want to be best. You know, as a blanket, um, we have made, I think, a lot of improvement. And I, I think as a system, I'm seeing evidence that we have improved. I think there are, when you look at the specific data, yes, there are kids who have improved, and some kids, well, okay, they're, they're looking, it's looking flat. Um, and it's the, that's the start. It's a continuous cycle of improvement where we're, we're as a district, we're never going to quite get there, um, but we're constantly moving toward growth, and we're constantly looking into, okay, what have we done? What has been effective? How can we improve upon that? Um, did we miss anything? Can we um, change our, our system of accountability so that we are including these things that we missed this time? Um, are we using new software that is an improvement from last software? How do we know it is an improvement? And then uh, how do we account for people who are now moving into the community and other people that have moved out? Um, and one of the challenges is that our cohort, excuse me, from K to Eight, um, it, it, it changes a lot. You know, there's a lot of people doing it at different times. And again, they go through individual uh, developmental needs, you know, and sometimes they get resolved sooner than later. Um, and, and I think, and again, this is the, the big challenge, almost to an exaggeration of any school district that you get any subgroup, is that it's a perpetually moving target. Um, and that yes, absolutely we take complete ownership of that responsibility as, as much as we reasonably can, um, and that we are you know, moving forward. So I, I would, if, if I were to shape the conversation, I would, I would try to shape it as, um, as a whole, I think we're moving forward, um, and I think we're making a lot of progress. On the smaller parts, I think we need to keep paying attention to these and not necessarily say, great, we made it, as much as we've made it here for this, for this um, indicator, now we need to focus on how we can improve from here. So I think that you are saying pretty much the same yes. thing, which is this, um, we all agree that there has been progress, right? right. And I know you just mentioned um, our free and reduced lunch kids, and although I have a great appreciation for having a specific conversation about that population, yes. I do not want to um, mix those two. I yes. think that both requires 
um, and warrants its own conversation. Um, I think that um, we have seen growth, but we I, there there's still much work to be done, um, and at least get to the point where I, I know for me to not have this exact same conversation a year later, right? Like, and so when we're talking about growth. And, and, and how far we've come along, can we actually talk about where have we found more glitches in the system? Where have we worked to improve our processes and procedures and our systems that are in place? So when we have a change in administration, a change in caseworkers, a change in students, right? right. We have a system of accountability yes. that we are, that can be clearly articulated and that we trust is in place. Mm -hmm. And if we do need to be nimble, then, and if we are dealing with the moving target based on what you said, then do our, do our goals reflect that? Will these need to evolve? Will we find out that based on the newer group of students that we have pushing is no longer working? And are we at a space to be able to say, even though we know this is a good practice, it's not a good practice for students A through L, or it's not, you know what I'm saying? Are we truly nimble enough? And, and, and have we provided enough support for your team to be able to make those shifts when you see them? Or, 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 or do we lock ourselves into something and then discover, well, we can't change this? With what she just said, that's why it's so hard to have like, this is the plan and this is in writing and this is what we're gonna go with because like you said, it could change. And the moment it starts. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, so. Based on what you're saying, there is a level yeah. of flexibility. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know, I don't have an answer. I'm just wondering if we have enough flexibility and systems in place to be able to say, yeah, we can change if we need to. Well, I think that's why these uh, presentations are Yeah, yeah I think it, And I think that, um, I think the level of intentional awareness has improved dramatically in the last eight years. And I think that um, this is- Did you say eight years? No, oh, yeah, I'm just going from the last since I've sort of been like paying attention. Okay. Um, this, <laughs> yeah, I can only speak to less. Okay. Um, and and uh, but I, and it, it, again, it's part of part of the only process. But um, but yes, I agree. And I, so I do think these are to reiterate. These are very important presentations. These are very important um, uh, conversations that I think are have been fruitful. You know, and I think are moving to the forward. So I think, um, how often are you planning to have an update on special ed? The Green Parker and special ed every other month since the summer. So I think it would be very helpful if, um, one, if there is very specific information that we may not say this is how you get the information. I mean, if, if there are things that are missing in this report or information that we think would be helpful to help us craft a better picture of um, glitches or, or processes and procedures that are in place, that are not in place, how are we going about figuring out what these things are? Um, I think we need to feed that information to data ASAP. Um, and then um, I did, and I will share this with the group via email, um, information on what some other, a couple of other districts where I know people who um, are challenged, have some of the same challenges and how they have approached it in terms of assessments or evaluations. Sure. I don't have any questions. So the transportation contract is similar to one that was brought last year. The this is, this is individual year by year contracts. We have one student that rides a Lincoln Way bus because again the, the rate is so wonderful um, that it's hard to pass up. But they require that we sign a contract with them yearly. So at this point the student is still there. And during this contract back, the rate does adjust every year based on the quantity of students um, on the route. And so that's the transportation. The student goes to Lincoln Way? The student attends a, an out of district program at Lincoln Way um, Cooperative Building. Any questions? 
Um, so the devil of both harm, harmless devil is the, the, the safe and positive approaches system we use. We use it mostly for de-escalation, but we do use it for um, restraint as is needed. Uh, we have two trainers every year. They require, it is a new requirement um, to us <laughs> that they require a whole harmless. So they just say we, we are training and we supervise our trainers, the trainers when they're with us and when they step away from us. We, we hope that they use everything that we have taught them, but we they, they don't want to hold that liability. So that's all. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I have begun a glorious journey of going through the board policy manual, starting at one colon ten. And we'll begin my journey all the way through until the end of the year. Um, looking for anything that's changed. And kind of the impetus for this was as we've updated things since I've started, I've kind of looked at some of these policies and they haven't been touched since 2008, um, which is what it seemed to impress was initially introduced in the district. So um, I've kind of done some digging, haven't seen revisions, updates that said, hey, we've done this, we've looked at it, no changes. So I've kind of done that. So I've broken the, uh, <coughs> I've started with one pull of 10, I've gone through uh, two pull of 120, trying to make it manageable, about 15 policies. Um, there are policies that I have submitted for first read that do have some language changes, which are highlighted. Um, there are policies that just have footnote changes, which I wanted to bring to your attention that don't need formal approval. Um, and those footnotes will go away uh, and they will not be part of the formal uh, policy. And then there's policies that have no changes or some that will be coming in the future or some that have already been updated. So just wanted to propose that to you. Um, for the next time, we'll be finishing off section two and section and again, all the updates are coming from press, so I'm taking right from press and translating all the else. So the parts that are highlighted, is that the ad or the delete? That is the ad. That is the change from what's currently been gotten to what press, what's in press. Any other questions? We fully support you on your journey. They need better news than us. Okay. School support and job description. So uh, we recently had an opening at Parker um, for school support aid, which was due to a transfer of a person to uh, a position at Lester. And in kind of talking with Ms. Crawford about the position, um, the Job description currently required the paraprofessional license. So that means somebody either had to have the license or had 60 credit hours to then go and obtain the license. Um, since school support aides, um, kind of thinking of recruiting for this position, instead of just posting it onto a district website and hoping to attract people that way, I posted it out on Indeed. Um, through Indeed, we got a tremendous response, 168 applicants. Um, express an interest. So kind of going through their credentials, um, I had to either tell them to come to the district website to apply, or sorry, you don't have a fair professional license, you're, you're, you cannot be considered for the position. Um, so out of the 168 people that expressed interest, 35 had a fair professional license. Um, so that we experienced a delay in filling the position. We actually uh, we just took action on the replacement who just obtained his paraprofessional license, I believe, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, with talking with um, Ms. Crawford, felt that the requirement might be limiting our potential to some real high quality individuals that could be out there. Um, the other foot of that is we currently have somebody in the school support aid position that does not have. <coughs> paraprofessional license so um, technically that person is in a position that that individual is not qualified for which would require us to, re to move that person to a position that they are qualified for so removing the requirement we don't have to do that so that's uh, we've talked with the FDA and they were on board with the uh, change as well 
Um, this format is also a new updated format, which is one of the things that I will have to be doing um, before January, um, kind of we're going through all of our job descriptions to update them for Fair Labor Standards Act, because uh, some regulations that are changing effective January 1st. So uh, the ones that you crossed out, like maintain positive interpersonal relationships with colleagues or establish? They're there, they're just language changes. Those were initially listed in essential job functions, but they were moved for qualifications as, you know, those, some of those job functions aren't really tasks that somebody's going to carry out for more okay. abilities and skills that somebody's supposed to have to be qualified to do this job. So the highlights and cross-outs were more language changes. Um, the big change is just that uh, the Illinois edu Professional Educator License with Stipulations is preferred. And then some things were added that, uh, you know, the terms of employment was added, the evaluation component was added, because uh, those are going to have to be added to all of our job descriptions. The, uh, up in the, the header, the position level, just spelling out that this is a bargaining position, it's a classified position, and then the Fair Labor Standards Act that this is a person who's compensated hourly and they are not exempt from the time, so they are eligible for it. How do you reconcile? Once be able to occasionally lift and move and push items at 50 pounds with intervening student health conditions. Other than that, I don't think that would make students that are 50 pounds or less. Again, that was a number that I think when updating it. That's our typical Yeah. 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 You know, our students, you know, higher above, you know, social energy, higher seats, and everything like that. That was uh, something that. It's a typical point that I should say. Can you explain? So I, what would a paraprofessional not do, but why would it have been beneficial to keep this the way it is? The paraprofessional license is more for adults that are really teaching students that might be doing an intervention, and that's kind of what our paraprofessionals do now where these individuals are more concerned about the security, student supervision, they're in the hallways, they're in the common areas, lunch time, um, if the elementary schools are out on recess, they're more of it's supervising the students or they're doing some kind of supervision function in the building, um, party slips, monitoring the front entrance. So they don't have the same instructional capacity that our current professionals do. So does the pay decrease? No, no, because the, this is still, this is that we have to be addressing uh, with the FDA in part. Is there any uh, consideration for if we really want this person that we would um, park them, for lack of a better term, in a, uh, a non-paraprofessional position while they get their licensure? Because it, it looks like on the ESB website that it's just really a matter of filling out the form. The, it, the person would have to be eligible for the license, and we don't have any positions right now without this change that um, we don't require the fair professionals. Okay. It's either they require them or they're, uh, you know, in some other capacity, like a custodian or you know, a like that. Okay. All right, so moving forward, would we, um, I mean, I guess in terms of, just so that we have a large candidate pool, and it's not a matter of you didn't click this thing, or you didn't, you know, go to South Book and fill out paperwork, you know, so that you could do this, um, you know, is there, I guess, any thought to kind of, um, Encouraging people that we have, you know, once you have, you know, your, uh, you're in this position, and we'd like you to go on to get your, professional <coughs> because you might be asked to do this, and that, you know, it's a, uh, if there's a fee involved, you know, maybe the district can spot them if they like this particular uh, uh, employee. And they're, they're currently within the, the contract. There are some incentives for our current professionals are classified staff for degree cycling. So if they do have the uh, a degree there, there is a official site. But I don't know if that exactly answers the question, Tim. If I'm understanding you see, so 
so it's one thing that there's a stipend that that uses professional development and you know staff can access. It's another thing if we build in an incentive um, for people to actually go and get the lights. Because if you can get the same job with, I mean, there, if you can get the same job without having to get the license, then what's the why do you need the license? Like why? What is the incentive to then do that? Right, because you get the job description now is written in a way where you don't need it. Right. So it, it used to be that um, you wanted to be a paraprofessional, you know, I'd be a paraprofessional. You know, you didn't have to go through. Um, and at some point, they said, no, you have to fill out, you know, this form and this paperwork. Right. Which, and what does the license get? Well, here, so how many schools and boarding do you have? Seven total. Seven. That's why this is. It's a really focused conversation that isn't applicable to the broad group of paraprofessionals. The reason they desperately need licensure is because we are typically adding paraprofessionals to work with our most vulnerable students. Right. And, you know, they typically don't have teaching degrees, they don't have, you know, that type of background. So this certification guarantees that there's just a baseline and set of skills because typically we're you know, assign them to work with students with additional needs, whether they're in the classroom or outside. So, for the school support aides, this just gives us the flexibility to hire somebody that doesn't have it. For all other positions, I wouldn't even consider adding the flexibility. Okay, I guess just to answer, and I'm sorry, one, one of the other things that happened too with um, the state eliminating the basic skills test, they didn't consider the elimination for the test for everybody else. So right now, uh, for paraprofessional licensure, it's 60 credit hours, or you could have passed the work piece test. But the way that the le legislature wrote the law, they've eliminated that option for paraprofessionals. So it's 60 credit hours, nothing else. Now they may change the, that and allow paraprofessionals to take the test to get the licensure, but right now it's 60 credit hours, and that's it for licensure. Well, what, oh, help me understand this. We're not asking school support aides to function as paraprofessionals. Correct. Right. No, and I read the job I'm reading. Correct. It's supervision and support Correct. in the learning environment. Yes. So mm -hmm. we're not asking for that. Right. I understand that. But if, as I understood your your um, narrative of our uh, hiring process for this particular thing, that you were, you're identifying, oh, there's, all these, there's a lot of great candidates out there, but unfortunately, they don't have this um, thing. They seem to have the other criteria by which, you know, it, they, they would otherwise be able to get a pair. So I guess I'm looking at, and maybe I'm conflating two different uh, issues of, you know, I always tend to think of hire the person and then, you know, train that person to be the person that we want because ultimately we want the best people to constantly work you know, here and have the best candidates pool and then have the best, uh, most qualified workforce. Yeah. Um, okay. So if I'm conflating two things, I apologize. And, and you might be. So for example, and out of that 168 uh, person pool, we could have had a candidate that had uh, extensive security background, maybe at a public, you know, at a college. Uh, great customer service skills. You know, dynamite salesperson in a previous life, and now they're just looking for something that's kind of okay. partners out. Right. Sure. But because they didn't go to college necessarily, they are not eligible for the paraprofessional license. Okay. So because of that requirement, they would not be qualified for a position. Okay, I got you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, Candace? Sure, we need some additional training. This is the report for that. We need uh, some additional in-person training just with the sheer number of staff members, given the cost of what we're bringing to the board. But uh, it is absolutely critical as we're moving forward. Uh, so uh, the, the size means it's, it's, it's an additional 18 months. Oh, there's no report in already? Okay. Well, it's hard to say. You mean software and training, yeah. and then I'm going to separate. Yeah. So this, this gives us five five trainers to come in and do even 
in-person training um, for both of our training sessions. The rest of the training that we're doing through our ambassadors and through our, our in-house people who are building the skill up, uh, this would allow us to have uh, five campus trainers who need to come on site. Um, our original uh, proposal with Canvas, we did not include that many people uh, or that many trainers to come out, and we want to make sure that we have enough people. If you can imagine training all of our staff or all of our teachers on a tech program, it can be distracting if there's not enough trainers in the room to be able to support it. Any other questions? Okay, we'll keep it moving. We've already discussed G and H. 2019 ISB resolutions delegate assembly representative. Yes, this is really two pieces. We need to at least discuss who that delegate assembly representative is going to be. You'll vote on it in November. This is the person who will cast your votes on the resolutions at the Triple I conference. Downtown last year, I believe it was Steve, correct? Who was it? I thought we were last year. He was about to told. Uh, I know. Okay, we'll take formal action then in November. Uh, is there any? See how eager we are? Yeah, that's 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 awfully that's quick. <laughs> any conversation on any of the resolutions? I'm sorry, say again. I said any conversation on any of the re resolutions. What we'll do at the next meeting, we'll go right on down the line. So we'll say, okay, it's a uh, student safety resolution number mm -hmm. one. IASB recommends that you do adopt it. How would you like to vote? You know, whether or not you accept it or you, you reject it, that is how Steve will cast his vote at, at the joint conference. They're fairly straightforward. Uh, the one that sticks out right now is that student safety, I believe we rejected it last time. That's the one about social uh, we need Steve to be on the news again, yes. so we need to, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Some little controversial I'll Steve. I'll get my, my powder so it's a little shiny thing. I think I still have it on my phone. Uh, did we want to discuss that tonight, or is that something that we want to review it more, or? Um, I say review and bring it back. Well, you have to vote, at least. Yes. Why well, you looked at me and hate it? No, 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 no. <laughs> you feel guilty. I do. I, do. I, do. I, do. I, I feel like you were. I just was for the camera. I did. He did. I know. No, no, really, they're not. They're pretty straightforward. Uh, but we have to vote next week because that's the last meeting before the conference. All right. We'll right. go over the next one. Okay. National School Board Conference. Yes. Um, Registration will open up soon. It's about $765 per person. Michelle and I will not be presenting at the National Conference as well. Oh, so we have, yeah. You're presenting. We have the state and the national cover. Yes. What time is that? Uh, it is April 4th through the 6th. Actually, it's already on the calendar, I think. Um, it's April 4th through the 6th. Is that McCormick Place? We don't have to decide now, just give it some thought because once it does open up, uh, if people want to attend, we want to get registered. When's the last time anyone's been at Wow, this was Timmy, yeah. so maybe five years? It says four years. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. The last time. I think she went to Boston. She went to Boston. We don't normally do this, but I don't even think we're members anymore. Because uh, it was so expensive. So it's, I think we backed off. It's yeah. Boston. And so we thought it would be a cool idea to submit the same proposal we did for the Tri Conference, only because this conference is in Chicago for the next year. And lo and behold, what does the conference go? Like? What do we get out of it? Same thing for the joint conference. You have what an opportunity to meet school boards from across the nation, go to different sessions, whether it's on governance or education, bonding, you name it. <laughs> there are um, it, it, it just just a commercial for for the nationals um, the last couple years in Timmy went. She did come back with a lot of uh, relevant uh, discussion, um, one of which you know, the 
that I, this was like six or seven years ago, uh, had to do a school safety, uh, but she worked with uh, Chris Brzezinski to uh, craft a craft a uh, school safety plan based on uh, information and in, in current conversation. She came back from that. Um, there was uh, there's there's been a few others. I think the last one uh, that uh, she and I had a conversation on. Um, it was um, it, it really had to do with the way that we, um, you know, as, as educators address the needs of our students. Um, and, you know, again, I mean, it kind of adds to the, the overall narrative around in our discussions. Um, but that one did not have a specific, you know, I've taken this, you're going to then turn it around and use it for this other thing. And I think that the uh, reason why, part of the reason why we stopped going was there was a general lack of interest to go um, uh, when it was scheduled uh, to a faraway place and spend a lot of money and not have a very tangible uh, take home or outcome that we could then turn around. And we also were uh, you know, trying to focus a little bit more on, you know, let's locally use the, uh, what we take back from the conference to, um, to shape some uh, some direction for us, you know, before we run off and do an extra thing um, in another state. So uh, I think it's great that it is in Chicago. Uh, whoever, if the board wants to support somebody going to that, uh, it might, you know, aside from one guaranteed incredible presentation, <laughs> um, it, it might be interesting to see, um, you know, what some of the conference topics are to see if they even relate to uh, where we are in our uh, in our area of interest in the projects we're working on now. Otherwise, you know, I, mean, I, I will not volunteer to go and I will reject the nomination. <laughs> so we don't have to decide this nope. now. We can decide later. And I think, you know, I don't think we typically come close to exhausting the funds that No, we don't. Those okay. are always things that just don't. Yep. Okay, November board topics. Any questions, concerns, things to add? Yeah. Okay, September financials. Just typical uh, financial reports. As Fran said, there are uh, old farmers who have a few updates to come through after. Fran's at the Skyward Conference. That's why she missed it. She's done it. Sure. Any questions? Okay, we do need to move into exact session um, to discuss matters relating to personnel, 5 ILCS, as well as litigation. I need a motion to move into exact session. So we'll move. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. We have no other items.